now. Uh, and welcome to our another session of Physics Dialogues. And today, as you know, we'll be talking about dark stuff in the universe. And um, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce you, uh, my colleague, Kiran O'Hare. Um, uh, Kiran uh, joined the University of Sydney just last year. And he came, um, he, he received a PhD in uh, Nottingham University at UK. Um, and uh, spent a postdoc in uh, in Spain, and after that he joined uh, quite recently uh, University of Sydney, our group, and we are very fortunate he brought with himself uh, he brought a, a rich expertise in dark matter, and so he will be talking about uh, dark matter and how we can detect that uh, today. So over to you, Karen. Yes, um, great. The Thanks, usual so, sorry before I start the, the usual rules uh, for people who joined today first, for the first time uh, please I kindly ask you to mute your mics um, but during the talk uh, uh, if you have questions please unmute and ask Kiran the question I think uh, should be okay all right and of course after the Kiran's presentation we'll have a Q and A uh, session discussion session all right so sorry Kiran go ahead. Right. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about dark matter and, and maybe inappropriately I've chosen a, a title slide in which no dark matter can be seen but is, is nevertheless there. Um, so the motivation behind my talk is, is partly from something that you often hear in, in sort of general outreachy style talks about cosmology or about the universe and that's statements like scientists have no idea what dark matter is. Um, now, I, I take a little bit of an exception to this, you know, somewhat lightheartedly, um, and it relates to the take-home point of my talk, which is that we really don't have no idea what dark matter is. In fact, we have a lot of ideas for what dark matter is. What we do lack is the time and probably importantly the money to properly investigate all of those ideas, but we do have a lot of ideas, and I want to go through um, a lot of different ideas. So there's going to be a, a very large range of, of subjects covered in this talk, um, but it's mainly going to be aimed at people who've, who've got a general idea for what dark matter is, what the evidence for dark matter is, uh, but maybe are not familiar with what's going on right now, particularly in the particle physics community, but also in, in astrophysics and cosmology, about what we're actually doing right now to try and figure out what dark matter is, because it's really the question which is driving a huge amount of research that's going on, on going on today. And if you look on the archive, there'll be you know between ten or twenty papers released every day, which are trying to address the dark matter problem in some way. Um, so I want to kind of capture some of that activity um, for you. Um, so there's really going to be three broad sections of this talk, and I'm going to quickly run through kind of the most convincing points of evidence for dark matter just as a refresher for people who've heard them before, um, and just to give you the most convincing ones for the people who are, who are less familiar. Um, then the most, most of the talk is going to be detailing different candidates for dark matter, um, and I'm going to order them by mass. So I'm going to start with the very mass, most massive candidates for dark matter, and move it down all the way to the least massive candidates for dark matter, just to kind of organize it in some way. And then I'm going to give you kind of my, my opinion on what the outlook is for the future, what we can expect to see maybe in the next 10 years. Okay, so let's start with, with the evidence. And for those yeah. of you who, who Kieran, come across, it, yeah. Kieran, I think it, it will be a good idea if you share the screen again. We don't see your slides. You don't see them? No. Okay. Um, sorry, okay. I don't actually, <laughs> sorry, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize it, uh, it stopped. Okay. Um, just give me a second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry for that. Okay, you see that? Yes, yes, all good. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, so yeah, some it must have stopped sharing for some reason. Okay. So here's here's my here's my my title. Uh sorry, my my first slide on on the evidence for dark matter. So here's here was the outline which I just talked about, and here is the first piece of evidence. So this is the thing that you'll usually see. In a, in a talk which is talking about the dark matter, the, the evidence for dark matter. 
And it's probably the, one of the classic pieces of evidence for the dark matter, and it's the one that most often gets talked about because it's kind of the easiest to understand. Uh, and it dates back to, to some observations that people like um, Vera Rubin um, and Ford and, and Bosma were doing in the 1970s, um, which is on the rotation curves of, of galaxies, nearby galaxies. So, so one of the classic examples is M31. This is the Andromeda galaxy. And if you look at the rotation velocity of the star going around Andromeda, um, towards um, very large radii, um, the, the rotations seem to kind of flatten off and you have these stars on the very edges of the galaxy which are moving around very, very fast. Now, if you do a, a simple balancing of the forces those, those stars should be experiencing, so on the left-hand side, you have the, the centripetal force and on, on the, on the right-hand side, um, you have the, the gravitational force which should, should be the, the force which is um, so giving rise to that centripetal force. Um, and you rearrange things, uh, you get the expectation for the, for the velocity, the velocity curve of the galaxy. So the, how the velocity depends on the radius. Now the observation that, that Vera Rubin and others made was that these, um, these velocities were approaching a, a sort of, a sort of a constant value. They were sort of flattening out, um, to, towards larger radii. But this, this formula would, would suggest that, you know, if you are, if you, if you at some point run out of mass, um, to, 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 to provide that gravitational force, that velocity should be, should be decaying because there's, there's, you know, the, the, the amount of mass should reach a constant. Um, but what nevertheless they observe is, is this flattening off, which implies that there must be some extra contribution of mass all the way out to the outskirts of the galaxy. And the implication of this is that galactic disks, because this is seen throughout the universe, are embedded in some halo which surrounds the galaxy uh, of invisible matter. So this is one of the classic pieces of evidence for, for dark matter. Um, what's equally as important um, in terms of the story of dark matter, um, but, but gets talked about slightly less in this context, um, is the dark matter inside the Milky Way, particularly the dark matter here right now in, around the Earth, around the solar system. And this is a little bit more complicated to try and figure out, um, but it essentially works in the same, same way that you're looking at the kinematics of stars. You look at the motions of the stars, which will tell you something about the gravitational potential that they're moving within, which in turn, if you account for all of the other stuff that provides a gravitational potential, you know, the stars, the dust, and the gas, whatever's left over is dark matter. And we do indeed see that we have a non-zero contribution of dark matter around the solar system. And it has a value around 0 0.008, plus or minus some error bar, um, solar masses per parsec cubed, which, you may, it, you know, it's difficult to get your head around um, what that number actually means, but it's, you know, it's, there's, the, there is a, because the, the mass of the sun is, is quite large, there is a substantial amount of dark matter contained within a small patch um, around the sun. But if you ask cosmologists or particle physicists what the most convincing piece of evidence for dark matter is, um, they'll probably point you towards a picture like this, which is the cosmic microwave background radiation. So the cosmic microwave background can be observed everywhere in the universe, no matter where you point your telescope. If you look for microwaves um, with a temperature of around three Kelvin, you will see the cosmic microwave background. And the reason it's everywhere is because it's the first light that we can see after the Big Bang. So it's not the first light that was emitted in the universe, it's the first light that we can see. Because it's the, 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 the light that was, that was left over at just the point when the universe had cooled down uh, just enough so that photons were allowed to freely propagate throughout the universe. So it's a snapshot of the universe when it was around 380,000 years old, um, and it's a near perfect black body spectrum. Um, if, you, if you plot the spectrum of, of this radiation, um, it's almost indistinguishable from a, from a black body. It's one of the most perfect black bodies spectrum spectra that we know about. Um, but nevertheless, there are these tiny fluctuations about one part in 10 to the five um, in the temperature of that radiation. And they have different sizes depending on this, the angular scales that you look at the radiation across the sky. And these fluctuations are, are of crucial importance for understanding the contents of the universe and therefore for understanding how much dark matter is in the universe. Um, now this is, this is a slightly um, less easy thing to, to, to get a mental picture of, um, but, but to try and explain why not necessarily, it, it's a little bit complicated to figure out how this implies dark matter, but to give you an idea of why we, why we think it's so convincing as a piece of evidence for dark matter, um, I want to just quickly go into, into a separate analogy, um, which is an analogy 
based on the idea of, of looking at the frequencies that make up a sound wave. So for example, you get a piano, you play a note on the piano, and you, and you, you record that note, and you do what's called a Fourier transform of that. So you split it up into its component frequencies. You can get something out, which is called a, a, a power spectrum or a frequency spectrum. And that frequency spectrum will have a series of peaks in it. And the positions of those peaks, the frequencies, will tell you the pitch of the instrument. So it'll give you the fundamental tone, and then it will give you the series of overtones, um, which make up the harmonic series for that note. And then the ratios of those peaks are basically all that's containing the information about the, the, the type of sound that you're hearing. So the timbre of the note, so whether it's a piano or a, or a flute or a saxophone, is all contained in the ratios of those, of those peaks. So going back to the universe, if you think about taking those oscillations that you see in the cosmic microwave background, you do some kind of frequency analysis. So you're looking at what are like the types of sound waves that were propagating through the baby universe. Um, and we get a similar kind of thing. I don't want to labor this analogy too much because it does break down a little bit because the universe is slightly different from a piano. But we have these series of, of peaks which we get out into this in the spectrum called acoustic peaks. Um, and similarly to, to, to the case of a, of a musical instrument, you can look at the positions of those peaks, which is in analogy to the pitch is telling you something about the, the size and the geometry, and also importantly, the total energy that the universe contains um, at that point when the CMB was emitted. Um, and then the ratios of those peaks are telling you what the universe contains. So, so if you're interested in particular, it's the second peak tells you a lot about how much of the normal matter there was in the universe and the third peak, and then this damping that occurs for high peaks, tells you something about how much dark matter there was in, um, in, in a kind of a nutshell. And you can see though these, these red dots, they have error bars. And you can see how good this fit is. So if you are moving around the amount of dark matter, say you wanted to create a, 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 a model universe which had no dark matter in it, this green curve that you would get out, this, this model, um, for, for what you expect this power spectrum to look like is going to look completely different by, you know, a staggering um, significance uh, because these error bars are, are absolutely tiny. So this is why we, when I show you a, a pie chart like this, this is really what we think the universe contains because we can measure with remarkable accuracy the size of the slices of this pie. Um, so we know now that this dark matter is there. It is um, present at the very early universe, as well as being present around us right now um, in the galaxy. Um, and, it, and it forms sort of the, the a crucial ingredient in how we understand the structure of the universe. So here's a really nice visual depiction of that made by the, the people on the illustrious simulation. This is the computer simulation of, uh, uh, of, 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 of the universe, of the structure in the universe. And what they've done is something really nice where on the left-hand side, they've colored in according to the dark matter. And on the right-hand side, they've colored in according to what we call baryons, which is basically all the other matter. So the, the, the hot plasma, the dust, the, the gas, the stars, everything else. And you can see that the dark matter sort of forms the skeleton around which the, the baryons can actually fall in and form galaxies. So, it's, so dark matter is, is kind of crucial in, 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 in the formation of structure. It's the only thing that really allows galaxies to form in the way that they do. Okay, so that's the evidence for dark matter. Um, and here's a little summary, including some things that I didn't mention. Um, but the, the point to, to stress is that we have evidence from dark matter right from the beginning of the universe up until now. We also have evidence of dark matter from the very, very larger scales down to the scales of, of nearby stars. So that's, this is the case. This is the case um, for dark matter. Now, what is dark matter? So this is the, the, what my talk is mainly going to be about. Um, and, you know, this dark matter on the face of it seems to confound um, all the attempts to try and explain it. it it, it, all of the standard model particles, for, for example, all of the elementary particles that we know about, none of them seem to have the right properties. All of them would just interact way too strongly um, to be dark matter. They, we, would, we would have definitely seen dark matter in the abundance that it is in the universe around galaxies. Um, so what are the requirements for a theory of dark matter? We want to con construct some kind of theoretical explanation which explains not just the way dark matter behaves in the universe, but also how it got there. This is the really important thing. We don't want to just conjecture some you know, particle which just is there and does the things that dark matter does. We want to explain why the universe created it in the quantities that it created it 
um, where given the fact that it seems to not really do anything at later times. So the first thing that we need is we needed to have a mass. That's, that's something we definitely know about dark matter. Um, and we know it needed to be created pretty early on because if dark matter was not created before um, the synthesis of the nuclei, all of the, all of the ratios in, the, in the, the different nuclei that were created in the Big Bang, so there's mainly helium, hyd um, helium hydrogen and lithium, um, they would be all messed up. So we need to know that it would, so we know that it was, it's uh, created in its abundance and it ha and it's some, something which has a mass. Um, secondly, and this isn't necessarily a requirement, but for it to be something that we can actually test, it should probably interact at some level with other stuff, with other matter. Um, but it shouldn't interact too strongly or we would have seen it in some prior observation. And then thirdly, it does need to do the things that we observe it to do. We need to, we need to make sure that it, the properties that this new stuff that we're conjecturing to exist does have the right properties so that we reproduce the galaxies that we see. Now, in the past, you may have heard the, the, the phrase cold to dark matter, and this very much still is the, the paradigm. It's, it's the most um, popular cosmological model. Well, maybe not popular, but it is the cosmological model which works the best. Um, and, and this basically means that the dark matter is made up of slow-moving, collisionless particles. But importantly, this paradigm is being questioned. Um, and I'll get into that um, towards the end of the talk. So before I, I go through the different candidates for dark matter, I want to quickly, just so people are, are kind of up to speed on this, because it's, it's a particular bit of technical terminology which is going to come up over and over again. Um, and that's the, the idea of, of, of mass scales. So particle physicists, when they talk about masses for particles, they almost always use uh, units of EV, so electron volts. So for those of you maybe in the first few years of your undergrad, you'll, you'll notice that EV is a, it's a unit of energy, not mass. And technically, we, when we say EV, what we actually mean is EV divided by the speed of light squared. So this is the, 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 the mass energy of the particle. But in particle physics, we tend to set C equal to one, just makes formulas look a lot nicer. Um, so for example, the electron has a, an energy of 511 keV. Uh, proton has like maybe a GeV, 938 MeV. Um, and the neutrino is the lightest particle that we, we know about, the particle that actually has a mass, that is. Um, and its, it's mass is probably less than 0.3 um, eV. So you can see there's a big, already a big um, hierarchy of, of, of masses here. Um, astronomers, on the under, other hand, will use various different masses. Probably the most common one is the solar mass, which is two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Um, so for example, the sun obviously has one of these. A uh, supermassive black hole will be like 10 to the six of these. So just so you know, there'll be a mixture of, of units of mass. Uh, for the very massive candidates, we're going to mainly talk about solar, um, solar masses. And then for the least massive ones, the more particle stuff, talk about electron volts. Okay. So what are the sort of masses that we could expect a dark matter particle to have? Um, so at the very lightest end, really the, probably the absolute lightest particle you could think about going to is 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, which is, which is you know, ridiculously tiny. We're talking about the neutrino, which is already ridiculously tiny. Um, having less than maybe 0.3 eV, this is, this is ridiculous. And the reason why this, is, this limit is in place is because at this point, the de Broglie wavelength of the dark matter particle, so this is the scale over which um, wave-like um, properties for dark matter start to take place, um, this, this wavelength starts to actually be larger than the smallest dwarf galaxies which you've actually seen contain dark matter. So this, is, this will come up right at the end of the talk. I'm going to talk about the lightest particles. Now, the heaviest mass for an elementary particle is maybe around 10 to the 19 GeV. This is the Planck mass. This is sort of the, the largest mass that we can actually think of a particle really kind of making sense within the kind of the framework that we, we work under um, in particle physics. Um, above this, it probably has to be some kind of composite object um, or maybe a black hole. Um, now, the heaviest possible mass for dark matter, full stop, probably needs to be something that will allow it to actually fit inside the smallest dwarf galaxies. So smallest dwarf galaxies will be maybe like 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses. So maybe you could think about, um, you know, black holes or something which were maybe 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 solar masses. This is maybe the heaviest you would might want to reasonably consider. Although, as we'll see, there are actually other constraints which push that a little bit further down. Okay, so here is all of the dark matter candidates that I'm going to talk about in the talk, and I'm going to go through each one. Um, starting on the right-hand side and moving over to the left-hand side. 
Um, and it's quite nice to categorize it like this because depending on the mass, the dark matter has to have different properties. Um, if it's really, really massive, it, it's going to have to be some kind of primordial black hole. If it's really, really light, it's going to have to be um, what we call um, and what we call ultralight dark matter, which is, which is a bosonic field. Um, it's the only way that the dark matter can actually behave in the correct way if it's that light. So this is a neat way to kind of categorize it. Although, as you'll see, there will be a little bit of overlap between the different categories. Okay, so let's start with probably what, what is, I, I think, the simplest type of dark matter to understand, um, and that's black holes. Um, and specifically, we talk about primordial black holes, because as I said, this dark matter needs to be produced in the very early universe. It has to be primordial, which basically means, you know, really, really old, produced in the early universe. And the mechanism for producing them is, isn't so complicated. Basically, you have the, the early conditions of the universe with this inhomogeneous um, state. And in certain random patches, you might expect to, to see uh, enough of an overdensity, just a random fluctuating overdensity, which will have a density high enough to collapse and form a black hole in the way that black holes form. Um, and you know you can think of this as being a natural expectation for the for the conditions of the universe after the Big Bang, um, and indeed primordial black holes are one of the oldest candidates for dark matter. It's, it's something that people thought was just going to happen in the early universe. Um, and, and in principle, that's a reason to like primordial black hole dark matter. In, in principle, it seems that we don't need any new physics to explain dark matter. It should it should just be something that happens in the very early universe from this inhomogeneous state. Um, that, that argument is quite nice, though it, it turns out in, in practice, actually getting the early universe to produce the amount of black holes that you need to explain that matter does require some, some kind of um, tweaking of the knobs to, 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 to get it to actually work properly. Um, nevertheless, it doesn't, doesn't mean that primordial black holes are, are a bad dark matter to candidate. It just requires a little bit more extra input uh, from theory to get them to work. Um, one of the other nice things about primordial black hole dark matter is that at the very least, they are black holes, and we do kind of know how black holes behave. Um, we've observed black holes in the universe. We, um, we, we have, you know, there are, there are numerous question marks associated with black holes. We do basically know how they work. Um, and there's a number of ways that you can test the, the primordial black hole dark matter. And here's a plot um, that you will see. This is from a recent review um, paper on primordial black holes. Um, and this plot is, is similar to lots of plots that you'll see in dark matter talks. Basically, dark matter physicists love to, to color in plots. Like, all we do is basically color in plots. We have a plot where we expect a dark matter candidate to live. Um, so it will be two parameters for the dark matter candidate. In this case, along the horizontal axis, we have the mass of the primordial black holes. Um, and then on the left-hand side, we have the fraction of the, of the dark matter, which is made up of primordial black holes. And we expect that the primordial black hole dark matter will live somewhere on this plot. And what we do is we run an experiment or an observation to try and look for it. We don't find anything. So we say, okay, we've looked here, we'll color in that part of the plot. That's the whole idea behind these constraint plots. And you can see there's the, there's the different colors that, that are plotted here um, are coming from, from, from different types of constraints. So we have a huge range of masses, by the way. So we're going down to the 10 to the minus 18 all the way up to 10 to the three um, solar masses. And just to run quickly through what all of these mean, so on the very lightest black holes, we have constraints coming from the Hawking radiation that they produce. We don't see any of this Hawking radiation, so we can rule that part of the parameter space out. Over here, we would have black holes which are abundant enough that they will be passing in front of stars all of the time. We don't really see that happening, at least up to a certain level, so we can rule out this part of the parameter space. Then over here, we have um, where, we, where we would expect um, black holes to be colliding and producing gravitational waves. Um, then over on the very right-hand side, you would expect black holes to be disrupting star clusters, to, so to be heating um, clusters of stars or to be disrupting binary stars. We don't see that happening, at least to the level that we'd expect, so we can rule that part out. And then we also have the fact that black holes would accrete matter, so we can also rule this up, because this is something that we also don't see, at least for this part of the parameter space. So this is kind of the general idea. This is the gist of what we do it for all dark matter candidates really is, is this kind of ruling out of the parameter space. So moving down the mass scale now to composite dark matter. And in some way, there is a little bit of overlap between primordial black holes and composite dark matter. The composite dark matter is kind of more generic. Um, some examples of, of composite dark matter would be things like machos. So these were one of the original dark matter candidates. 
MACHO stands for, for Massive Compact Halo Object or Massive Astrophysical Compact Halo Object. And it's just some generic name for, for dark, clumpy stuff. Um, and, it, and it can be of any form and it can be constrained in kind of similar ways to primordial black holes. Um, some, ex some specific ex examples of composite dark matter particles would be things like um, quark nuggets, which people have proposed, which are these large um, clusters of quarks, which are some way bound together. Um, these are um, on a little bit shaky ground because it's hard to imagine how you could have clusters of quarks which aren't just interacting with loads of stuff. Um, but this is something that, that people do work on if you can figure out how to sequester them away from, from standard model interactions in some way. Um, then we also have these, uh, this idea of dark stars, which is you can think of as just some, some new species of dark matter particle which all clusters together into a star-like object. Now, I will say that the composite dark matter is probably the part of this parameter space which is least well explored. It's maybe the, the least fashionable at the moment, um, but it's mainly unfashionable because it's kind of hard to come up with an idea for, um, for, for a composite um, dark matter candidate. However, there is no reason why we wouldn't expect dark matter to be composite in some way. Um, it, it should, in principle, fit all the observations. You just need to explain how it got there in the first place, and that's what's very hard to do. Um, so moving on down a little bit now to um, the WIMP. So the WIMP if, is maybe the dark matter particle that most of you will have already heard about. And for a long time, it was considered the, the, the favored dark matter candidate. Um, and, and the exact definition for the WIMP kind of has kind of shifted and moved over the years. Um, you'll get different answers depending on who you ask. But the, the general picture that you have in your mind is that it's a massive particle, so probably mass, more massive than, than the proton, maybe similar masses to, to nuclei. Um, and it's just got, it's just this big particle which has very weak interactions. It doesn't necessarily have to interact with the weak, via the weak force, it just needs to have very feeble interactions. Now, the, the reason why WIMPs were so popular for, for such a long period of time, even, even today, I mean, I, I, you shouldn't count them out, um, is because they show up in, in this extension of this animal called supersymmetry. Um, so what supersymmetry is, is it, it, it's this theoretical framework which posits a fundamental symmetry between bosons and fermions. So for a boson, there's a part in a fermion. For every fermion, there's a part in a boson. So it kind of doubles the number of particles that you have in the standard model. Um, so this seemed kind of quite a wasteful thing to do, but it, it really solves a lot, of pro a lot of really, really crucial problems in particle physics, which I, I, I won't go into just, just for the sake of time. Um, and one of the things that, that makes it so convincing, particularly for, for, for people in the circles that work on supersymmetry, is it's kind of the most natural way to extend um, the symmetries of the standard model. The standard model is all about symmetries. That's how it's constructed. That's like the, the bread and butter of the standard model is symmetries. And, and supersymmetry really is the, is the, the natural next step. So it, supersymmetry remains very, very popular um, amongst certain crowds, despite the fact that none of these particles have been observed um, and they were hoped to be observed in, in LHC experiments. So importantly for us, forgetting all of this stuff about, about all of these new particles, the lightest supersymmetric particle in, in most of the, the configurations of supersymmetry um, is stable. So therefore, it's an excellent dark matter candidate. And the type of dark matter that it is, 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 is a WIMP. And this, this is one of the, the, the main driving forces in the experiments looking for WIMPs. And even today, the experiments looking for WIMPs are the most developed of all of the experiments looking for different types of dark matter candidate. And, and the way that you do this um, is basically, if you look at the diagram like this, so you have WIMPs, which should be all around us in the Milky Way galaxy. They should be flying through us all the time. So if you set up some kind of experiment and you watch it very, very carefully, at some point you should see WIMPs coming in and, and interacting with a standard model particle via the exchange of, of some force carrying particle. You don't necessarily have to know what that force carrying particle is. You can, you can just be agnostic to that. All you're looking for is some interaction of this kind. So in practice, it will look something like this. So you have WIMPs coming in, you'll have an atom, which you've set up in some, some way in your experiment. And the, the typical interaction that a WIMP will undergo is, is a nuclear scattering. So WIMPs, just because of the, their size, they're really, really heavy particles. The thing they're going to most like to do is to scatter with nuclei. So you're going to have nuclei, which are kind of ionized out of their atoms, and then somehow dumping all of their energy in the form of ionization or heat or, or, or photons or whatever you want. Um, and this is how you detect the WIMP, is, is to see this nuclear recall seemingly come out of nowhere. Now, the, the main problem um, with this 
is that wimps aren't the only thing which, which do this. We have all sorts of other forms of particle out there, particularly cosmic rays, which are coming in all the time into whatever experiment you want to set up. So the main effort that you put in to trying to build one of these experiments is to put it deep underground, preferably under something like a mountain. Um, and you just really, really carefully watch um, for the interactions which are going on inside. And you, you try your best to shield from all of the possible backgrounds. You can never get rid of all of them, really. Um, but then this is, how you, this is how you rule out Dharmati. You just sit the experiment going for a length of time. And if you don't see anything, you can do the coloring in thing again and rule out part of this parameter space. So as I say, these, these experiments are, are the longest running. They've been, there's been a huge number of these experiments running all around the world. Um, maybe what will be most interesting for you is the fact that um, there is actually one of these underground labs being built um, in Australia, in, um, in an old gold mine in, in Victoria, um, near Stoll. And this will be the first underground lab in the Southern Hemisphere, which for, for various theoretical reasons turns out to be qu um, quite a nice thing. Um, to have is, is a lab in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. So we're all very excited about this. And the first um, experiment that it will host is called SABRE. And for those of you who've, who've heard a little bit about, about detecting WIMPs before, there's this famous experiment called DHARMA, which for, for decades have been saying that they've detected dark matter, uh, but nobody believes them. And SABRE is going to be one of the experiments is really actually directly testing this uh, claim discovery of dark matter. So this is something to, to, to look forward to. So, you know, we have had all of these decades of, of work. Why haven't we seen the WIMP yet? Well, a few weeks ago, interestingly, we did see something kind of interesting. There's a really big experiment. One of the biggest experiments that's running at the moment is called Xenon 1 ton. Um, one ton because it has a ton of xenon. And they reported an excess. So an excess being, you know, they've, they've observed extra events over the expected number of events that they, they, they thought they were going to see. Um, and you can see it here. So the red line is their expected background. And then the error bars just below maybe 5 kV start to kind of rise. Um, and the Xenon one ton experiment reported this. They, they put this on the archive for everyone to see. They, they, did, they did a nice um, seminar about it. Um, and already, just based on this tiny little, little blip, really, you could say, um, already there are 90 plus papers um, on the archives in a couple of weeks trying to explain this. Um, so this is, this is kind of giving you a flavor of the, the, the types of stuff that we get excited about these days. Um, but as I say, this is by, by no means a, a confirmed detection of dark matter. Um, there are for numerous reasons this, this signal looks a little bit weird. Um, so more data is definitely going to be needed to, to rule this out. But no, you, know, you never know, this could be the first, the first hint of dark matter, who knows. So now moving a little bit down the, the mass scale from WIMPs into to another type of dark matter, which unfortunately a lot of people have started to call light dark matter, which I, I think is a really terrible name because it's, it's just kind of not as really fancy or, or descriptive as, as, as WIMP, uh, although WIMP kind of doesn't really mean anything either. Um, but light dark matter basically is just WIMP-like particles, but are slightly lighter. So rather than, rather than GV scale particles, you're talking about KV to MEV scale particles. Um, so the main difference between a WIMP and, and a light dark matter particle um, is just the types of interactions that they like to undergo. So a typical WIMP interaction, as I say, was, these, was this hard nuclear scattering. So you have WIMPs coming in and scattering off, off nuclei. Um, light dark matter, because it's much, much less massive, um, the types of interactions which, which are, are, are more favorable to look at are interactions with electrons. So rather than hard nuclear scattering, which is quite easy to describe, you have much more complicated physics to do with um, atomic interactions. So things that can happen are like dark matter could come in and it could ionize a single electron, or it could cause a, some kind of transition between energy levels, which would maybe emit a photon, um, or it could do this weird thing where it slightly nudges the nucleus, which causes a slight mismatch in the wave functions um, of, uh, of, the, of the atomic orbitals and the nucleus. Um, and this is something that's called the Migdal effect. This can also lead to the emission of electrons. Um, and really, it's only in the last maybe 10 to 5 years that um, light dark matter has seen a surge in, in popularity. Um, and part of this, this surge in popularity comes from the experimental side, and part of it comes from the theoretical side. Um, on the experimental side, we have all of these new technologies which are allowing us to detect these, um, 
these very, very small energy signals because detecting KV signals is hard enough. Detecting EV signals is, is extremely difficult, at least under the standard types of experiments. Um, so, we, so these experiments which are looking for light dark matter these days are using, using things like semiconductors. Um, so semiconductors are these materials where you have um, a particular energy um, band structure where the, the band gap between the valence electrons, which are involved in the chemical bonding, and the, and the conduction band electrons, which are allowed to freely conduct through the material, um, is quite small. So for example, the, the classic example is silicon, which is a band gap of about 1.1 eV. So crucially for dark matter experiments, which want to look for these very, very low energy interactions, um, the, so something that is a really nice um, materials to look for, um, because if a dark matter comes in and it hits an electron, it only really needs to hit it with enough energy to excite it above the band gap, and then you can detect it. Then you can see that the electron which has been excited into the conduction band. This is your signal. Um, so these are the experiments which, are, which people are developing now, um, along with a lot more um, kind of futuristic nanosciencey and condensed matter type systems, um, which I won't, I won't get into. Um, but this is, this is part of the reason why light dark matter has seen the surge in popularity. But then along with that, we have the theoretical input. So people have actually come up with ways of, of generating light dark matter candidates with the right abundance in the early universe. So for example, um, there are particles like dark photons, which can be evolved in this. So these are kind of these massive counterparts to the photon, which behave in kind of similar ways. Um, dark matter, which has a very, very tiny electric charge, also can, can work as a light dark matter candidate and, and, and kind of fit all the observations. Um, so there's a, a, an industry now in, 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 in theorists coming up with candidates for light dark matter, um, which is another reason why um, these are, are seeing such um, a, a kind of growth in popularity now. And just to show you an example of one of these experiments look like, um, so this is uh, from the sensor experiment, which is probably the most advanced of these types of experiments. This is using um, silicon in, in CCDs as their, their detector material. Um, and you can see that all, you get all of these different um, the different spots show up for different types of particles. Um, and the very, very tiny ones are the ex excitations of single electrons. And this is basically what a dark matter would do. A dark matter will probably excite a single electron or maybe a couple of electrons. So it's really the challenge is to look for all of these single electrons, look for how many of them you expect to see, and do you see any excess in the number of single electron excitations? Um, so this is a, another really nice um, way to look for dark matter. And this is, this is probably one of the ones which is, people are most excited about these days. So the last um, class of candidates that I'm going to talk about are, are what's labeled up here as ultralight dark matter. And this goes really for candidates lighter than around a kV. Um, and really, I'll only talk about one type of particle, and, and that's, that's the axion. And so the axion can have a, a, a wide range of masses. And the main property that the, all of these different kind of subclasses of particles share is that they're all bosonic. So they're all bosons. So they, they all behave um, in ways that Bose-Einstein statistics uh, detects that they behave. So you can see under, under here, I've labeled kind of the different types of axion, different flavors of axion that you might expect. So the classic axion um, is probably the nicest one to start with. Um, and the axion is, is an extremely light particle, way lighter than ever, anything we've talked about so far, way more weakly interacting than ever we've, anything we've talked about so far. Um, you know, it will have a mass between maybe an MeV and a nano EV, so super, super light. Um, and you know, putting on my, you know, this is my opinion hat here, I, I think the axion is probably, right now, probably the most well-motivated candidate for, for dark matter. Others will, will disagree with me. Um, and the reason is kind of from just the, the aesthetics of, of, of the theory. The axion was produced independently of dark matter as a solution for a, for a completely separate theoretical problem in particle physics. There's a problem called the strong CP problem, um, which I won't um, get into the details of, but it was, it was developed in the 1970s by, by Pecci and Quinn. Um, and the, the, the motivation behind the name is that the axion is said to clean up this problem with, with, uh, with, with the the, um, the electric dipole moment of the neutron. Um, and the, the motivation of the name comes from the fact that there's this popular laundry detergent at the time um, called Axion. So the, the, the thing that the Axion does um, is, that the, the facilitates its, its detection, is that it interacts with, with photons. 
And it interacts in the way that you see over here. So you have this axion coming in and, it's, and it has this, this coupling to two photons. Um, so you can have axions which decay into two photons. You can also have axions which interact with photons um, in some way, um, and you, which, which kind of permits their conversion from axions to photons and then backwards. Um, and all of this stuff basically violates Maxwell's equations. So you may have, you may have come across Maxwell's equations um, in, in your physics courses. Um, you'll see them look like this. This is kind of showing you how um, how magnetic fields and electric fields are related to each other and how they respond to things like electric charges and electric currents. If you have axions, these equations are no longer the full story. The equations look like this. So you have all of these extra terms which go as this, um, in, in, as proportional to this new constant G A gamma, which is basically the, how strongly the axion couples to the photon. Um, and this is all fine. I mean, we use Maxwell's equations to do, you know, a huge number of stuff in a huge amount of stuff in physics. Um, this is all fine to do as long as this GA gamma is really, really small. And here's another, another one of these coloring in plots. So on the left hand side, you have this coupling. So the axions at the very top of this plot are the very strongly interacting ones. The axons at the bottom are the very, very weakly interacting ones. And you have all of these different constraints which are coming from different places. So I, obviously I won't get into all of them, but the ones in red are lab experiments. These are, these are the experiments that are running um, by people in laboratories. Um, green ones are astrophysical bounds. So these are people looking for axions, doing stuff in space. And then the ones on the right-hand side, the blue ones are all coming from cosmology. So you can see this, the axion, you know, because it couples to the photon and we use photons to do you know, a whole range of stuff in physics, um, the axion is, is, is being constrained through a, a great number of different ways. Um, but what I want you to notice is this diagonal orange band going through the middle of this plot. And this is where the QCD axion, so this is the axion that was, was um, come up with to explain this other problem in physics, this is where that should live. And you can see this band has not been explored at all. It's only this this experiment right in the middle, ADMX, which has even started to scratch that band. So this is why I say that, you know, anyone who says that, that you know, we, we have no idea for what dark matter is, probably our best idea for dark matter has, hasn't even been touched on yet. The experiments are nowhere near um, the ability to rule out this um, candidate as a dark matter particle. Um, so I think the axons really are the ones to watch um, in terms of uh, candidates for dark matter. So the very last thing I want to, in terms of candidates that I want to talk about are the, the, the super, super light ones, the ones I, I mentioned right at the beginning. So these 10 to the minus 22 EV candidates. Um, so these are sort of like axions, but they, you know, they don't come from the, the same um, perspective as the, of these, these uh, the, the Petchy and Quinn axions, which were, which were invoked to explain a separate problem. They, they, they're similar particles, but they don't um, explain any other problems. Um, and they can have these very, very light, uh, masses um, like 10 to the minus 22 EV um, and they're so light that they're de Broglie wavelength so the, the scales over which their wave-like effects start to become important um, is similar scales um, to the sizes of galaxies and this can lead to some very interesting um, effects in the context of astrophysics in the context of, of people running simulations and looking for these types of effects on galaxies um, this is often also called fuzzy dark matter because of the types of effects that it gives rise to. Um, and the best picture to have in your mind for this is to think of this um, type of dark matter as being like a field. So a field is just something which has a value in, at, um, at every point in space. And in particular for fuzzy dark matter, this field is oscillating rapidly. Um, and the amplitude of the oscillations um, is largest when you have large densities um, of, of this fuzzy dark matter. And this is something that people are looking at um, quite actively now, especially running simulations of universes um, under fuzzy dark matter, um, and, you, and you end up with completely different types of effects that you do for the standard cold dark matter. Um, so instead of um, you know, these nice um, clumpy subhalos, um, you get wave-like characteristics appearing um, in, the, in these cosmic filaments. You see these interference patterns appearing. Um, you can also th see things like um, these large Bose-Einstein condensate-like um, uh, clusters of axions at the very centers of galaxies. And these are all completely new, you know, not well studied at all effects. Um, but nevertheless, you know, the, the observations are reaching this, the, the point where we can actually start to, to be able to look at 
galaxies and galaxy clusters and dwarf galaxies and actually start to be able to tell the difference between these two different paradigms. This is why I'm saying that, that people are starting to, to question this, this cold dark matter um, paradigm um, because it, it turns out that these, um, these types of effects could, could be very real and they could solve some outstanding problems that the cold dark matter does face. Um, so, Archil, how much time do I, do I have left just to wrap up? Well, uh, you can go five, five to, yeah, roughly five minutes. Uh, okay. And yeah, so, I mean, I've come to the end of my, my kind of whip through all of the Dharmata candidates. Um, what I want to quickly go through, this probably won't take five minutes, um, is just tell you what I think you can maybe expect in, in say, the next 10 years. So, going back to primordial black holes, Primordial black holes kind of fell off in favor for a while, um, up until maybe around 2016, um, when they, they suddenly got this new surge of interest thanks to a new probe, um, and that probe is gravitational waves. So the LIGO um, Observatory for Gravitational Waves observed um, uh, uh, two black holes merging and, um, and emitting gravitational waves. Um, suddenly people were thinking, you know, were these the standard black holes which come from, from dead stars? or were these primordial black holes that LIGO was seeing? And this suddenly sparked a whole wave of interest in, in black holes again. Um, and you can, you can expect this wave to continue, I think. So LIGO and Virgo will continue to, to, to upgrade and improve, to take more and more of these, um, of, these, of these black hole merger events, as well as you know, black hole neutron stars um, and all of this. Um, and also there is the possibility that we will at some point in the future also have a space-based um, gravitational wave observatory um, called LISA. Um, which will be able to, to, to have a, a massively extended sensitivity to uh, gravitational waves. Um, we also expect to see new wide deep astronomical surveys to look for, for primordial black holes via their microlensing um, events. Um, there's loads of different ways that primordial black holes could be constrained. Um, so we can expect to see a lot of activity on this front. Um, in terms of composite dark matter, it's, it's not super clear to me what, what's going to happen there. Um, on the observational side, there are loads of ways that you could, you could try and constrain composite forms of dark matter, but the issue is just coming up with a really good idea. Um, but I, I, as I say, I mean, this composite dark matter could work. Um, in particular, there, there, are, there are particular subsets of axions which would form these, these what we call boson stars, which would be an example of this. Um, this is something that, that people are only really starting to work out now because it requires a lot of very tough um, analytical and simulation work to try and understand how these things were produced in the early universe and, and how they behave. Um, so this is another big question mark and, and it's, it's difficult to say what's, what's going to happen here. Um, on the WIMP side, um, I will say the, the WIMP experiments are the most developed. They're the, the most sensitive experiments um, looking for dark matter. Uh, and there is a next generation of experiments um, a really, really massive one. So experiments which, which are larger than, than the ton scales, they have more than a ton of, of mass uh, of particles that they're looking for dark matter. Um, and you know, these, these experiments are gonna be extraordinarily sensitive. They're probably gonna be some of the most ex sensitive experiments that we have. Um, and, and my guess would be that if in 10 years time after this generation of experiment, if we haven't seen any signal whatsoever of WIMPs, um, they will have significantly waned in popularity more so than they have already, I think. Um, on the light dark matter side, um, really this is only coming up now in, in the last five years, um, thanks to all of this progress that I mentioned. And you know, there are many questions to be asked on the theoretical side. These, there are lots of different candidates which people are, are actively investigating at the moment for light dark matter particles. Um, and there's also probably on the horizon lots more technology to be exploited, especially from, from interdisciplinary sources. So, for, so looking at condensed matter physics and, and nanoscience to try and figure out different kind of novel ways of, of exploiting um, technology to detect these very, very low um, energy signals. So this is something really, I think, I think um, would be worth watching. Um, then lastly, on the axion, um, I, I think the Axion has extremely solid backing um, from, from theory. It's, it's one of the most attractive ideas just from, from an Occam's Razor, razor standpoint. Um, and as I say, we're, we're really quite far away from actually ruling out the Axion, the most well-defined um, Axion, which, which solves all of these problems. Um, you know, we only, we only have one experiment, which is called the Axion Dark Matter Experiment, ADMX, which has actually been able to exclude um, the Axion in a very, very tiny window. And it's going to be probably 10 or, or probably maybe even longer than that 
um, to actually exclude all of the axions. So, you know, we, we're definitely not going to be outside, out of ideas for dark matter um, within that time. We're going to have to be looking at some of these experiments, which I, which I have listed at the bottom, um, before we can actually rule out the axion. So I think this is still something to, to put a lot of hopes in. Um, then lastly, um, on the side of fuzzy dark matter, um, and more generally, the idea of, of, of evidence for dark matter from, from astrophysics, um, we're going to have you know, a series of, more, uh, of, of increasingly wide and deep um, astronomical surveys, which are going to you know, tell us more and more about the structure of the universe, the structure of galaxies and galaxy clusters. Um, they may find something weird. They may, you know, they may find that CDM, cold dark matter, really just does fit every observable. Um, we don't really know what, what they're going to see. Um, one, I think will be one of the most exciting developments will be on the side of, of computer simulations. So we have you know, rapidly increasing available computational power, plus really novel and new techniques, um, particularly involving machine learning, um, which will help us expand the scope of these simulations to the point where they're not just trying to kind of reproduce galaxies, which is something which, is, which they still haven't quite yet mastered, uh, but to actually use those simulations to really be the laboratories for testing ideas of new physics. So I think this is something um, to watch on the, alongside um, all the other stuff that I talked about. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, just, to, just to drive the, the, home, the point home again, it's not that we don't have any idea for what dark matter is, we do indeed have a lot of ideas. And if you want the XKCD view, you can, you can have a look at this. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Kieran, uh, for a uh, for brilliant talk. Very informative. And now we have time for questions, please. Especially I encourage students to ask questions if you have. Okay, we have something in chat. So, can, yeah, I can, I can read for you, uh, Kieran, the question from the chat. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Joshua is asking, um, why does dark matter and baryonic matter contribute to different peaks in the sort of convolutional picture that we had on earlier slide of the CMB? So the question is that why do they contribute to different? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and really probably the answer is more complicated than I can actually express in in this talk, and, and really the, it's not that they contribute to different peaks, they do all contribute to the peaks. Um, it's just that the, the, the first peak, which is sort of the, the peak which corresponds to plasma, which was able to contract in and then expand out again just once before the CMB was admitted. Um, and because you have barons which, which are kind of a, like to attract themselves inwards, and then you have photons which provide a source of pressure outwards, um, really, the this, this scale of that, um, sorry, the, the size of that, of that first peak um, really is, is telling you about, is really what, we, what gives the most sensitive um, constraint on, um, on the amount of baryons. Although, as I say, it's, it's really the fit of, to all of the different um, peaks, which gives you the, the full real fit to all of the different contributions. Um, it's just, it just so happens that there is a particular physical process in place um, to do with the baryons for that, for that first peak. I think the relative uh, height was, which is also matters, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's yeah. yeah. Okay. Do we have more questions? Oh yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll tell you about the main one. So this is, okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, read, I'll read out the question, yeah. So the question is why, um, uh, why is, a, is, a, is a Southern Hemisphere um, dark matter laboratory useful? Um, the main motivation initially for building particularly Sabre in the Southern Hemisphere is because of the particular type of signal that Sabre will be looking for. So Dharma, this is an Italian experiment, what they've observed is not just a, an event rate, which they are, which are they, they are saying is dark matter, um, but an event rate which modulates over the course of a year. So it has a sine wave modulation. Um, the, the peaks um, during um, during January um, and has a has a sorry, I think it's a peak during June and has a trough during during January. Um, now this modulation is something that you expect dark matter to do, and the modulation comes from the fact that we're spinning around the solar system, um, but. 
lots of other things could be modulating, in particular backgrounds which come from some kind of seasonally varying process. Um, so, for example, if the temperature of the of the atmosphere was was varying over the course of the seasons, you might expect the cosmic ray flux to also vary with the seasons. Um, lots of things could also be modulating with with the seasons. And Dharma don't know um, what that background could be. They they say that they ruled everything out, and they're saying that you know it it, it must be dark matter, but everyone else disagrees with them. So one of the ways to test that hypothesis is to go to the southern hemisphere. And if it is a seasonal process, the phase of that modulation, so rather than, than peaking in June and, and having a trough in January, it should be flipped um, by six months. So you should have a peak in January um, and a trough in June. So that's, that's what Sabo, if Sabo see that, that, that will be proof that, that what Dharma is seeing is, is a seasonal um, source of, of events. So something which is, is correlated with the seasons. Now, there are lots of other um, motivations for having a dark matter experiment in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, off the top of my head, one of the really nice things about um, the Southern Hemisphere is the fact that if you look at the, the geometry of the Earth with respect to the dark matter halo, the Earth is spinning around the galaxy, um, and we're spinning around the galaxy in a particular direction um, which means that we expect to see what's called a wind of dark matter coming from a particular point in the sky, which corresponds to the direction of galactic rotation. Now, it turns out for most of the year, the southern hemisphere is actually behind the Earth with respect to that wind. So it's kind of in the shadow of the Earth um, with respect to the wind. So if you have a particular types of dark matter, which like to interact with stuff inside the Earth, um, you end up with these kind of quite dramatically different signals if you're looking at the southern hemisphere compared with if you're looking at the northern hemisphere. So this is another really nice reason why it, it might be nice to go to the, to the southern hemisphere. It's also nice to just have lots of laboratories as well, not necessarily in the southern he hemisphere, but, but kind of all across the, the world, because it just helps you kind of understand the systematics um, to do with different experiments which are located in different places. So that, that's a kind of a, a summary of some of the motivations. Okay, guys, please unmute the mic and uh, and talk. Uh, um, yes, I have. I've got. A, I've got a question. Um, uh, so, um, it's, it's, this is from one of your earlier slides, but you said that the dark matter density of the uh, our solar system was like zero point zero zero eight um, solar masses per parsec cubed. Yeah. Uh, from like Joss's paper or something. Um, so you said it's a pretty big number, but like, isn't it really? really well, to me, it seems like a really, really small number if we convert to SI units, wouldn't it? Um. Yeah, so, and so, okay, so the particle physicist version of this unit um, is 0 0.3 uh, GV per centimeter cubed. Um, so if you take something like, um, like a WIMP, like a WIMP which has like, like, like a GV mass, um, then you would expect, based on this density, you'd expect um, maybe like one dark matter particle per, uh, well, one of, one of the things that people often talk about is the dark matter particle per pint. So if you have a, you have a, a pint of volume, then you would have one wimp uh, per pint. And, and that's pretty substantial. I mean, that, that given, given the fact that, we, that those wimps aren't just kind of sitting there, they're, because we're kind of rotating around the galaxy, they're streaming in all the time with like 300 kilometers per second velocities. Um, if you have that many particles, you know, per, you know, small amount of volume. That's quite a, that's quite a large flux of particles. Um, and actually, pretty much for all of the candidates, other than the really, really massive ones, so the things like the really massive primordial black holes, you expect to, to be sitting in the dark matter. So for the really massive black, black, primordial black holes, yes, probably the nearest one isn't, isn't going to be, you know, in the laboratory. It's probably going to be, um, you know, maybe on the, on the similar scale as like nearby stars. Um, but yeah, for all of the particle forms of dark matter, I, I would say it's a pretty high flux of dark matter particles that we'd expect to be seeing kind of passing through us all the time. Um, the issue is that like that, that flux needs to get multiplied by the probability of interaction to get the, the overall signal. And that probability of interaction is just always really, really low for it to, for it to fit all of the observational constraints. Uh, yep. Uh, so I was also wondering like, so in comparison to like uh, the amount of dust in like our solar system, for example, how big is that number in like, comparison in like orders of magnitude? Is it like a lot higher than the dust or? Um, 
you might be asking the wrong person. I'm not sure exactly what the what the density of dust is in the in the local galaxy. Um, I I mean, don't we talk about there being like a few atoms of of hydrogen per like meter cubed or something? So I think it might be comparable to just the ambient. I mean, it wouldn't be comparable to like say a dust cloud, but I think just to do like the you know the interstellar medium, I think it, I think it might be comparable. But as I say, I don't want to I don't want to. You know, that's, 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 that's the right answer. That's sort of my my guess. All right, thank you. Okay, do we have more questions? I have a quick question, Kieran. Yeah. Um, is there, it has the, you know the edges ex experiment? Has that been used as a probe for dark matter models as well? There's a CMB distortion associated with that experiment. Do you know yeah, much? Yeah, um, yeah. So, for example, um, you can constrain certain types of interactions with with axions with 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 edges. Um, I know people are trying to explain the edges um, with particular types of, of dark matter annihilation, which is providing some heat source. Um, I think it turned out to actually make the signal that that edges saw you needed some kind of weird interactions with weird, weird, weird like velocity dependencies and things um, there are also um, primordial black hole constraints to do with uh, accretion um, of, of uh, primordial black holes around the, the edges epoch um, that can be used to, to constrain primordial black holes as well um, as, a, as opposed to like super vanilla stuff um, I'm not sure exactly if, if um, um, people use um, edges um, but I think probably in the future with with like more and more detailed um, 21 centimeter observations, um, particularly things like the ultralight axions will be will be constrained quite heavily um, by these types of observations. So yeah, it's it's an important signal. Okay, cool. Some more questions. Um, hey, Kieran. Thanks so much for the amazing talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, could you tell us more about your work um, in dark matter and what you're currently investigating? <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for the ability to plug my own work. I don't actually have any slides on my, my own work. I can tell you what, um, just if we go back to um, this slide, what I'm, I mean, I, I guess I started out like most people do with, with looking at WIMP detectors. Um, primarily my, my interest is, is on the, the detection side. So what the detector needs to do to be able to make a convincing detection of a WIMP. Um, in particular, I was looking at um, uh, types of experiments which can measure the, the direction of that dark matter wind that I was talking about. Um, that's something that I, I'm still very much interested in. Um, I've also worked a bit on the, the axions, so the, the really well motivated axions um, on experiments looking for them. Um, and I would say these two, um, the WIMPs and the, the axions are the, are the ones which I've, I've looked at most heavily. So yeah, just in a nutshell, that's what I work on. Thank you. Kieran, there is a question from Tibor. He's asking, uh, could you elaborate on uh, different axion models, KS, oh, yeah. Z and the DF? Yeah, great. So yeah, so this is a little bit, um, it, it gets a little bit complicated in, in the weeds, um, but I was saying that this um, diagonal band of axions are, are the, the well-motivated models for axions which solve the strong CP problem. Now there are specific configurations or, or if you like realizations of that model um, to get them to actually not just solve the strong CP problem, but to, not, to solve it and not be too strongly interacting uh, with all of the standard model particles. So these are what are called um, invisible axion models because they're kind of rendered invisible some way. And usually it turns out this is where the axion starts to, to, to look a little bit kind of more complicated than it initially um, sounded, but, but bear with me. Um, usually that involves um, invoking extra heavy particles in order to, to get this, um, this the theory to work. So the, the KSV, KSVZ model, so by the way, the KSVZ and the DFSC, um, they're just the, the, the initials of, of the people who are involved in, in developing these models. Um, so the, the KSVZ model um, is probably one of the simplest models, um, and the DFS, DFSC model um, is a slightly more um, complex model, which has uh, you know, a larger number of, of different parameters to tune. 
but they basically just correspond to different um, ways of getting the axion to kind of work um, within the standard model. Uh, and they have different, they, they generally lead to the same types of signals, but in the context of the photon, but in the context of other particles. So for example, um, axions interacting with electrons or nuclei, um, the KSVZ axions don't interact very much with electrons, whereas the DFSC axons um, interact much more strongly with electrons. Um, so that's an example of one of the, the differences between them. Um, I, I will say though that all of this higher energy stuff, all these like more massive particles which you need to invoke to get the axion to work, they kind of don't really affect much the, the, the later phenomenology of the axion. So I think the, the axion still works as a kind of general concept. These are just particular models which, are, which are kind of you know, fix, the, fix the nuts and bolts to make it actually sort of all hold together as a, as a theory. Um, but, but there are many other um, potential models that you can think of. Okay. Uh, so people are asking for the slides. Yes, people are asking for the slides. I think we can share that uh, maybe. Yeah, Kieran? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I always put slides for my talks on my website, which I think is linked in the main web page that you made, Archul. So oh, excellent. Uh, yeah, you can check there, but then I'll, presumably they'll be upload, uploaded elsewhere. Yeah, uh, another so. thing is that we will be putting these recordings on uh, yeah. school's YouTube channel, so you can, you can watch that afterwards as well. Um, so are there any other questions to Kieran? So may maybe I'll have one provocative question uh, <laughs> uh, to provoke you. So, so far, the, all the evidence, you, you explained this very well, all the evidence uh, about dark matter comes from the gravitational interaction of dark matter, uh, rather than uh, the hypothetical interaction with the usual matter, which, which mm. all these experiments based on you discussed. So, of course, there are the, the pe people still contemplate that maybe there is no dark matter, and uh, it's just a gravity tricking us at galactic scales or something like that. Yeah. Uh, can you comment on, on this? Yeah, so there's a whole um, other side to this story, which is kind of, I, I suppose you could say kind of the underdogs in this story are, are the people who pr propose that um, gravity should be modified rather than a new source of matter be, be introduced. Um, and if we go back to the evidence for dark matter, one, one of the real successes with, uh, in this story was, was this concept of MOND, which stands for Modified Newtonian Dynamics. And it's a very simple extension to just Newtonian gravity, um, which was able to reproduce the um, rotation curves um, of galaxies. And it, it does still, to this day, work quite well in, in, certain, in certain cases. Um, now, it, it, it becomes a little bit more problematic when you look at slightly, the slightly more complicated stuff that, does, that dark matter does. For instance, you, if you just go one stage outwards, you look at um, galaxy clusters. The evidence that we have for dark matter in galaxy clusters comes from, from gravitational lensing. So at, at this point, you, you, Newtonian dynamics, modifying Newtonian dynamics is not going to be sufficient. You need to go to the relativistic theory. You need to look at uh, a general relativity and you need to be modifying that. So people did that. People went away and they, and they looked at, at, at doing um, a relativistic extension of MOND um, in theory called, called Tevez. Um, and it worked for a while, and then people found that there were some kind of pro problematic um, issues with with uh, with Tevez, um, just as a theory on its own. And one of the, but as a theory to explain dark matter, it turned out it was not able to reproduce this. Um, I mean, we this this really shows that the early universe contained some kind of um, non baryonic form of matter. Um, so what the challenge for Tevez now, or, or a modified theory of gravity, is to explain why just by modifying gravity, you end up with a, with a clear separation between what we think of as normal matter and some other form of, of dark matter. And it, and it turns out that, um, as I see that, yeah, uh, Garant has, has put um, somebody, a, a colleague of ours, has actually now come up with um, a form of Tevez which does do this. So it turns out that you do kind of need to introduce extra things into your theory of gravity. You need to introduce extra stuff, which kind of plays the role of dark matter um, in the early universe 
um, and then if and then it sort of evolves into into sort of its mon like state to reproduce the successes in the late universe. Um, if you ask me, I, I think that's a little bit not in the spirit, in the initial spirit of Mond to add new stuff. You should just be extending, you know, gravity. Um, but I think what the CMB tells us is just that, you know, just a simple, you know, by, by analogy of going from Newtonian gravity to, to general relativity was just kind of like a rethinking of, of, of gravity um, to, to get like a new perspective on the issue. People were thinking, can you just do a rethinking of that to explain dark matter? I think kind of the CMB, I mean, I, I could definitely be wrong, but I think the CMB shows that just a rethinking isn't really going to be enough. You're probably going to have to add in new stuff. Um, and it may look more like a, more like a modified gravity um, in the end. If this new theory ends up being successful, that will be, that will be interesting. I, I don't think it's, um, it's, it's possible to say. But as I say, any new theory of gravity is really going to have to do this. And up until this point, this, is going to be, this has been very difficult to do. Uh, Grant, would you like to add uh, to this? You know, uh, Grant shared. Um, uh, um, talk I about Mond. I mean, I haven't got much to to, to add uh, about this new paper. Um, it, it does seem to do a little bit of magic by transforming. Um, the, you put another field into the universe; it behaves like dark matter at large scales. It behaves like Mond at small scales. Mm -hmm. I, 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 is it better? I don't know. I mean, people are already griping about it because it, you know, it has a lot of freedom to it. Um, but yeah, this stuff needs more work. Yeah. So what, what do you think would be, I mean, if I can instead, you know, do these modifications like, uh, like this one, maybe not very successful and a little bit contrived, but still, what would be the smoking gun to just just falsify all these theories, uh, Giron, what, what do you think? To say that, oh, the gravity is not, is not the, the thing. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you sort of, you're not really, it, it seems to me that you wouldn't ever have a smoking gun. You would, I mean, if, if, yeah, okay. If, if these, if these models are, are, you know, constrained to the point where they're making a real prediction about something very specific about the way that the universe should behave, on some scale, you know, that, that would be great. I don't think that's, that, that's the case yet. Um, but to me, it seems that like, to actually move to the point where we're seriously considering what more widely as a community, um, modified gravity is really less gonna be a smoking gun for modified gravity, but a complete extinction of all possible ideas for dark matter. And we're far from that point yet, I think. So we're completely out of ideas because just nothing seems to produce anything that maybe we are, um, at the point where you know we're, we're seeing that dark matter really just interacts gravitationally, and that's it. Okay, and there is a question from Ian. Uh, Kira, no mention of dark energy, and there are, appears to be a lot of it. <laughs> well, yeah, it does seem that way, doesn't it? Um, and so people do work on dark energy. People have ideas for what dark energy could be. The, the, the model which, which, this, the, which the CMB was fit under to create this assumes the dark energy is, is in the form of a cosmological constant. Um, this seems to, be, to not really fit into, into anything very naturally in terms of our intuition of, about why it should be there, just, just existing everywhere in the universe. Um, people, people come up with all sorts of ideas for, for scalar field theories, which might work if you have some form of, of scalar field, which just exists everywhere in the universe, and that's the thing that, that provides the, the accelerated expansion of the universe. I think we are at the point where, where we're still building just the ideas for, for dark energy. We're, we're far from the point where, where we can really test these ideas for dark energy, because um, then they're, they're not really fully worked out yet. So I, I, I couldn't really give a, a talk this long. Um, well, I, I personally couldn't. On dark energy, because I just it's I think there's still too many question marks about all of the different classes of model, um, whether or not they work, how you can actually test for them um, um, at, at all. So that, that's that's my that's my two cents on on dark energy, even though it is obviously, as you say, very outstanding as a problem. All right, I think do we have more questions?
If not, then uh, I think it's time for us to finish this session. And thanks, Kiran, again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you.